Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar series on race splitting multiple access 2021 organized by IEEE Comsoft WTC Special Interest Group on RSMA. This is our seventh webinar and it's our great honor today to have Professor Carlos Mosquera from University of Vigo as our distinguished guest speaker. So uh, please allow me to make a brief introduction of Professor Carlos Mosqueras. Professor Mosqueras received his master's degree from Stanford University in 1994, and he received his PhD degree from University of Vigo in 1998. He held visiting positions with European Space Agency, the University of New Mexico, and the University of York. He was one of the promoters and the director at the Gradient for five years, and he was the director of the Atlantic Research Center on Telecommunications Technologies for three years. He held different patents in collaboration with industry and has co-authored two books and over 140 cited conference and journal papers. He has co-organized uh, several international conferences and special sessions on communications and is a reviewer of different uh, European research agencies. He is also a member of the Satellite Network of Experts founded by uh, European Space Agency and he, in the field of satellite communication. And he, he was co-recipient of the Best Paper Award at several international conferences. And he is now an associate editor for the Frontiers in Space Technologies Journal. Okay, before uh, Professor Mosquera's talk, I would like to remind the rules of our webinar. During the 15 minute talk, please keep yourself muted and you can type your question in the chat box. After the talk, we will have a 10 minute Q&A session. You can unmute yourself to raise questions or I will choose two to five questions from the chat box. Okay, enjoy the talk. So let me end my screen, stop share. Okay, Carlos, you can share your screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. And my thanks also go to Professor uh, Bruno Clerks for this uh, kind invitation just to, to share my, my work on the application of rate splitting during my activity in satellite, satellite communications. So I would like just to expose three different use cases that I've, I have found during my uh, activity in this, in this field. In particular, the overlay cognitive radio over broadcast uh, networks. Also the multiple input single output uh, broadcast channel with magnitude uh, uh, channels the uh, information at the transmitting and also being free approaches. All these uh, three cases have been uh, developed in collaboration with different co-workers among them uh, Alberto Rico, a former student of mine, which is now with Qualcomm in San Diego. Tomás Ramírez, from, also a student from mine uh, here at the University of Vigo. Professor Nelly Noels, University of Ghent in Belgium. Mario Caus and Adriano Pastore from CPTC in Barcelona. And also Nader Alaga from the European Space Agency. My thanks also go to all of them because we have made all the work that we are going to, I'm going to present here. So let me start first with the uh, cognitive radio case, which actually was, there was a lot of activity a number of years ago, but still is, I think is quite rele relevant, at least in this, uh, in this context. Well, the, the setting is the, the following. We have a primary, a primary network here in blue, where we have a primary transmitter, just trying with a given coverage area, the primary coverage area, we, where we have a number of receivers. This is, for example, the case of a typical television broadcasting application. And actually, what is important for our for our case is that the the signal, the in this case, the broadcasting of the television signal, is uh, transmitted to this primary transmitter from a satellite through this primary signal delivery. And this is very relevant because at the same time, if someone else wants to enter into this network just to use the the resources, the frequency resources, it has access to this primary signal delivery. So it's not a sort of a theoretical assumption, but it's rather practical. 
because again, practical cases you can receive, you can access to this uh, primary signal also from somewhere else and not only from the primary transmitter. So the idea is just to be able to understand how we can exploit this, uh, the insertion of uh, some terminals, the, the black terminals here, which are going to, to form the secondary, the secondary network. This, is, this follows the overlay uh, cognitive radio paradigm. That is, there's a secondary transmitter which has access to the primary signal. Um, it will need at some point, we'll see that, we have to reinforce that uh, coverage also. So the question is, what is the capacity of the secondary link? In principle, we'll start with just one single single receiver. Later, we'll, we'll try to understand what happens when we consider a number of them. So again, we have uh, the primary, primary transmitter, a number of primary receivers, just one secondary receiver, which is going to to receive signals from both the primary and the secondary transmitter. And the assumptions are, as mentioned earlier, the secondary transmitter knows the transmit primary message, right? Because he can receive that signal from the, from the satellite. But the secondary transmitter cannot use, for example, dirty paper coding to cancel the interference, the interference, the primary interference onto the secondary receiver, because the channel is unknown. I mean, the secondary transmitter knows the primary signal, but it has any. It has no knowledge about the channel between the primary transmitter and the receiver. So it has no knowledge about the effect of the interference on the receiver. So dirty paper coding or any related scheme is out of the out of the question. So the constraint is just to keep the the coverage area of the primary service. I mean, we cannot degrade the initial coverage of the primary service. So what are our design parameters? Well, the transmit power available to the secondary transmitter, P PS, which is going to be uh, divided into the power, which is going to be allocated to the original, to the primary service, one part of it and the other part will be allocated to the to the secondary to the secondary service. So this is going to mean that we are going to apply a message splitting. One part will be allocated to the primary service and the second part to the secondary service. In terms of the coverage, we need uh, the required scenario for the primary receivers is denoted as epsilon naught, right? where R sub RP is the, the rate of the primary service. So this is the, the threshold which is going to tell us whether a given terminal is able to decode the primary, the primary signal. Related to that is the power margin. I mean, the, the coverage area, the original coverage area, all the terminals have a different power margin. Well, the most restrictive terminal, the one which is closer to being non-covered, its corresponding margin is denoted by M. So with that, the preservation of the primary coverage amounts to this relation here, where the, the power that as a secondary transmitter we, is needed to, alloc to be allocated to the primary service needs to meet this condition in terms of the required SNR, the power margin of the primary service and the power allocated to the secondary service. So with this, we can start to understand what are the different situations that we're going to find here. So different, again, this is the primary coverage of the original service. And depending on the location of the terminal, we have different situations. For example, we're going to refer to as a black space, that situation where the terminal, the secondary terminal is just inside the primary area. Okay, so in that case, we of course we will have to allocate power. The secondary transmitter will have to necessarily allocate power to the to the primary service. Otherwise, we'll just uh, degrade the primary uh, coverage. So this is going to be needed, and the secondary the secondary receiver will have to decode the primary signal. The interference of the primary signal will will have to be decoded. This will be also the case, 
in what we refer to as gray space. Gray space refers to, to those terminals which are outside the, prim the primary coverage, but not far enough, so they still suffer from some from some interference from the primary from the primary transmitter. So again, we'll have to allocate some power to the primary service, otherwise we will be degrading the primary area. And we also have to decode the interference coming from the primary transmitter. The final regime, the final case will be that for which probably you are familiar with the term white spaces. White space will refer to that situation where the terminal, the secondary terminal is pretty far away from the region, from the primary coverage. So in that case, we don't need to allocate any power to the, to the primary signal. We don't need to reinforce the primary signal. And we just, in terms of the code, we can treat the, the interference, the residual interference as, as noise. So all in all, these two regimes for the secondary terminal can be labeled as uh, treat primary interference as noise. Depending on location, we'll have to, to apply one of these two regimes, treat the primary interference as noise. This, is, this occurs when the secondary terminal is not able to decode the primary signal. I mean, the power coming from the primary plus the power coming from allocated to the primary coming from the secondary transmitter is not enough just to get enough SNR. It's below the decoding threshold, the SNR threshold for the primary service. The other regime will be the strong interference regime. That is for that regime, the primary is decodable. So the primary signal will be decoded prior to the decoding of the secondary of the secondary signal, which is the ultimate signal that the secondary receiver is interested in. This is the case when all this uh, a combination of the, these two powers divided plus noise and the, the interference from the secondary signal is above the decoding the required SNR for the primary signal. So the optimization, again, we are still with just one terminal, one secondary terminal. This is all single, single antenna terminals. So the optimization, actually, we have two different problems depending on the regime. If we treat the interference as noise, then we have a linear fractional program where we want to maximize the signal to interference and noise ratio. I mean, our design variables are the splitting, the splitting of the power, the power allocated to reinforce the primary service and the power allocated to the secondary term, uh, service. The constraints are, of course, the, the cap for the power of the second end transmitter and the preservation, the preservation of the primary coverage. So this gives us a linear fractional program. Well, the two variables, they um, are such that the sum needs to be below the P sub S, the power of the secondary service. The other regime leaves us a simpler problem, so to speak. The strong interference regime is just a linear, a linear program where on top of the preservation of the coverage of the primary service, we need to guarantee that the primary signal is also can be also decoded at the secondary terminal. This is why we have this additional, this additional constraint where we have here a new margin that corresponds to the secondary receiver. So by doing that, we are going to, we'll see that in the simulations, the coverage area, area of the primary system is extended because we are allocating, allocating system, uh, uh, power to the primary service and we are guaranteeing that the primary signal is decoded even beyond the boundary of the primary uh, region. So let me just uh, show here a simple case where in terms of the achievable, uh, achievable rate for a single secondary receiver. In this case, we're considering a primary transmitter uh, located at zero, a secondary transmitter located as a distance r. This is the distance which is going to parameterize this, uh, this plot. And then a secondary receiver, which is uh, two units to the right of the secondary transmitter. And here we pull different curves, but essentially we need to pay attention to the following. The top red curve corresponds to the achievable uh, secondary rate 
in the absence of the primary service. So we cannot do better than this, right? So depending on the on the value of R, depending on, on, on the location of the secondary transmitter and receiver, we find different situations. Here on the left, we are inside the primary coverage area. So the, the, this, this continuous red line denotes the achievable, the achievable rate, which is labeled as black space. We, we, we go all the way to the right, we are in a situation where the, the capacity increases when we move uh, far away from the primary transmitter and the primary terminals. And this is a white space. And we get closer and closer to the, to the upper limit. And in between, which has something, we, ha we have a great space where the capacity is given either by the interference decoding regime or treat is interfering as noise. Depending on the specific location, we'll have to resort to one regime or, or the other. On the inter uh, in any of these regime, in any of these regimes, the transmit power of the secondary is not allocated, is not fully allocated to the secondary receiver. Only full allocation to the secondary receiver occurs here for the white space regime. But again, this is sort of a, I would say, simple or at least uh, it's not too practical because we are just considering one terminal. What happens if we want to design a secondary service with a number of terminals higher than one? Well, we can do a, a, at least a couple of things. We could consider a unic, uh, the unicast case. Um, we could resort to an orthogonal allocation and consider one secondary receiver at a time. So not much, no further discussion here. So we repeat the same process a different, for example, time instance or frequency carriers by allocating orthogonal resources to the secondary receivers. But the most challenging case would be that for which on top of the primary broadcast service, we have a secondary broadcast service or multicast service as well, where we, have, we want to transmit the same message to a number of secondary receivers. So we'll have the previous case, but with different uh, secondary receivers uh, located on different different places. So the goal would be for that number of uh, uh, NS receivers, maximize the common rate, R service, such that, again, the primary service is not, uh, is not compromised. So this is the, the new problem. So the design variables are still the, the same. The power allocation weights for the splitting of the initial power allocated to the primary and the secondary service, and also the vector of decoding strategies, because now we, we need to find out which strategy is more suitable, not for just one terminal, but for all of them. So each decoding strategy might be treat interference as noise or decode the interference, right? And we need to decide which one is the most appropriate. So in principle, we'll have a number of different on different problems just to for the embedding of this uh, secondary broadcasting service onto a primary broadcasting service. The good news is that actually we can go down from the potential in, in two to the NS number of uh, decoding strategies. We don't need to check uh, all of them because actually if we just uh, order the receivers uh, according to the in decreasing the, the, the power margin, we see that we only need to check these uh, NS plus one possibilities. Either all of them are treat interfering as noise or the first one inter uh, decode interference and the others uh, treat interference as noise and so on and so forth. So this is a substantial reduction in the, in the complexity, but still it leaves uh, a number of convex problem, quasi-convex optimization problem, NS plus one optimization problems, where we need to, this is a multicast uh, exercise, right? So we need to maximize the minimum, right? The minimum of the capacity of all those uh, terminals, again, subject to the preservation of the primary coverage and also enf enforcing or guarantee that the secondary the primary signal can be decoded by the corresponding secondary terminal if 
if the re uh, regime is such that we consider that the interference needs to be decoded. So we have an S plus one quasi-convex optimization problem. So let me just show just to, uh, to conclude this first uh, case, some uh, simulation. In, uh, to start with the gray, uh, gray space case, where we have the, the green, the green coverage, original coverage, the dot, red dots are the, the primary terminals. The primary transmitter is just the X here. And the primary, the secondary transmitter is this cross here. And all the blue circles denote the secondary receivers. So as we can see here, by applying this uh, method, what we are doing actually is just preserving the original coverage and offering the secondary service to all these uh, terminals which are outside the primary, the primary area. Actually here, the decoding strategy, strategy for all the receivers needs to, needs to be the, uh, a strong interference regime that is decode the primary, the primary interference. And just, just to complete the, the setting here, we have the, the numbers and here we have the power allocation the blue one corresponds to the allocated power to the primary service, whereas the 0.86 corresponds to the power allocated to the secondary service. And the SNR threshold is just 10, 10 dB. Another case would be one for which we are enforced to extend the initial coverage. That is, on top of the secondary receivers, there's a sort of an agreement between the primary and the secondary nervous in such, in, in such a way that the, this new red uh, X here denote primary terminals. So by inserting a new secondary transmitter here, we are able to extend the original, the coverage of the original service on top of, of, on top of creating a new, a new network for the blue terminals for a different broadcast uh, scenario. And again, here all terminals need to decode the primary signal. Um, finally, the white space case where the, the, the secondary network is uh, far away from the primary area. So there's no need to allocate any power whatsoever to the primary service. That's why here we have zero. All the power is allocated to the secondary service. And that's why the interference is treated as noise. There's a small degradation of the primary coverage area big due to the residual signal coming from the secondary transmitter. But still, it's not a problem because there's no any terminal, any terminal on this, uh, on this na na narrow strip of, of, of land. Okay, so this concludes the, this, uh, the application of, uh, let's say, power splitting or rate splitting to the, for a cognitive radio. And now let me move on to another to another case now already with multiple antennas where we are we are we don't have any information about the phase of the of the channel which by the way is the case in all applications that i'm sharing with you here phase is not exploited at all just the magnitude of the channels is what is known as the transmitters so for this second for this second case well, the motivation is a multi-beam satellite. Well, actually, the satellite generates a number of beams. Here, I'm just showing two of them, beam one and beam two. We, on a given, on a given time instant, we want to, to send different signals to a couple of uh, terminals. The discontinuous lines represent interference because, of course, the beams are not ideal, and each beam is going to leak some signal onto the neighbor onto the neighbor beam. So this corresponds to a, to a channel, in this case with two transmit antennas uh, with a, and two receive terminal. This is a, a, broadcast, a broadcast channel for which we don't have any face information at the transmitter. This is for practical reasons. Some cases it's difficult just to acquire face information of the transmitter. So no, we cannot apply things like uh, pre-coding, for example. So the, 
the challenge of the, or the goal here is to see what can be done in the absence of phase information here, just magnitude information. We know the, the, the quality in the sense of the SNR of these channels. So P is the power, the power on the, on the satellite, which is available over these two beams. We are in a per, per antenna power constraint case. So P over two is the power which can be allocated to each of these two beams. And again, the transmitter knows, has only the knowledge of this, of this information, the magnitude of these, two, uh, of these uh, four channels here, no phase, no phase at all. But the receiver has a full CSI. So before making our proposal, let's just review a couple of uh, well-known results for related cases, not exactly the same case, but just related cases. The first one would be the interference channel. That is, we have two transmit antennas, two, two receivers, of course, cross, uh, cross interference, but we don't have antenna cooperation. This is the well-known interference channel, in this case, the multiple input single output interference channel, where there's no uh, cooperation between the two, the two transmitters. Well, this case, there's a well-known result. It's 40 years old by Hang and Kobayashi, which uh, they um, obtain an achievable rate for this case based on rate splitting which for the, for the Gaussian case amounts to the additive super, uh, superposition of a private message coming out from each antenna along with a common message, which has, is going to be decoded by both receivers. So this is the Hanko Ayasi uh, scheme, which gives rise to an achievable, to an achievable rate for this interference channel, which again is related to our case, but not quite because we, we have a cooperation. By the way, here, since there's no cooperation between the two terminals, even though you have phase information, you cannot exploit that phase uh, information. Another, another, res another result is uh, by, by Jafar and Andrea Goldsmith, which is the MISO broadcasting channel with a vector magnitude CSIT. That is, this, in this case, this applies, for example, to the really fading, uh, a sort of isotropic fading, where the, the receivers, oh, I mean, again, sorry, the transmitter knows the, the magnitude, the global magnitude of the, resina, of the signal being uh, received at the different terminals, but not the individual, magnitudes, just the overall power that each uh, terminal is uh, is receiving. So this uh, uh, that's why the name for this case is vector magnitude CSIT. Here we have a cooperation between the antennas, but we don't have access to the individual magnitude of these uh, of these channels. Well, the the answer, the the channel, the channel capacity for this case is based on superposition or super, superposition coding and successive decoding. So, and, and this is achieved with the superposition of two uh, independent Gaussian vectors for this case here. Well, this is for the for two antennas and two terminals, but the result generalizes to an arbitrary number of, uh, of terminals. So again, mm, Somehow superposition coding is uh, present here, but it's not exactly our case because actually we can exploit some, we have some information in terms of directionality. We are not in an isotropic case because we have information about the individual magnitudes. So since we have that information, the scheme that we can apply for this uh, magnitude CSIT case is just rate splitting in combination with the space time space time coding. So the idea is, okay, I have to transmit antennas. I have two messages intended for the two different terminals. I'm going to split each of these two messages into a private message and a common message, either for the first message and the second message, right? And since we have cooperation, we are going to put together both uh, common messages into a MC uh, message 
which will will be of course uh, encoded with a channel code but also it will be a space time encoded right we will use alamuti alamuti for this because with alamuti we can achieve the the channel capacity in the absence of uh, phase information so we will transmit through the first antenna the combination of the private message and the corresponding output of the Alamuti code. And through the second antenna, we'll transmit the second private message and the corresponding output of the of Alamuti. Note that we are combining the two messages, the two common messages. Actually, we can modulate how much of each uh, message, individual message, uh, is going to contribute to the global common message. And here is the part that is the combination of Alamuti with the uh, with rate splitting. So this is the <clears throat> these are the expressions for what uh, was uh, I just said. In blue, I'm denoting the weights alpha uh, uh, lambda one and lambda two. These are the weights that we'll have to design. I mean, how much of private and how much of a common message are going to are going to be part of the two of the two transmit signals, lambda one and lambda two. The achievable rates with the Gaussian code books are written here. We have the, the achievable rate for the first uh, private message, the achievable rate for the for the second for the second message. And this is the common the achievable rate Sorry, Lina, I think I touched something here. I hope I'm sharing my screen now again. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, it's uh, moving forward, yeah? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So I was saying that with Gaussian code books, we have the private rates and also the, the common rate. The common, the common rate is going to be the minimal because we are multicasting the common message to, to the two different to the two different terminals. So the good thing is that with Alamuti, the decoding of the common message is quite uh, quite simple at the terminals. And this is the message which is uh, first decoded and then just uh, move, uh, 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 extracted before going for the respective uh, corresponding private messages. And also more importantly, we can apply link adaptation because the achievable rates do not depend on the channel phase. I mean, we just have information about the magnitudes. Well, that's good. This is what we're going to do. And um, with that information, we know how fast we can transmit even in the absence of phase information. And just for the record, the, the achievable rate for the two users are the, the addition of the private private uh, rate and the common on the common rate. This parameter alpha is going to modulate how much of the common message go to goes to each of the two of the two receivers of course the the sum rate is the same regardless of uh, of alpha okay so the optimization here is just this problem the achievable sum rate maximization it has the maximization of the sum of the private messages and the common message and the parameters are the the weights lambda one and, and lambda two of course uh, between zero and, and one well this problem i mean it's not that difficult but it's someone uh, involved in terms of uh, of algebra but it's not difficult to check that the the results are the possible solutions depending on the of course on the weights of the different uh, channels are either at the corners of the of this uh, square or along this uh, line. This is the line essentially which separates. Uh, sorry, Professor Mosqueras. Uh, yeah. we, we are stopped on page 21. And the slide is not moving. At least okay, moment. yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, let me, let me just uh, insist again here on sharing. Yeah, it works now. Now, okay. Sorry about that. Twenty-one. 
okay, now it's 22. So the achievable sum rate uh, maximization is what I was uh, discussing. We need just to, to find the weights, the corresponding weights for the private and the common message for, the, for each antenna, right? For each uh, message. So the, the sum rate is here written. Uh, lambda one and lambda two are the parameters that we uh, need to be designed. And what I was telling is that these parameters, well, it can be checked, this problem can be solved uh, analytically. I'm not writing the, the expressions here because there are someone involved, but essentially what is important just to realize that the, the values are either at, at the corners, I mean, zero, one, one, zero, et cetera, which correspond to in some cases to the to NOMA, right? Or along this uh, red line, which essentially this red line separates the which uh, terminal is more restrictive when decoding the common message, either terminal one or terminal two. So again, the solution can be obtained analytically for this uh, for the two users case. And before showing some uh, numerical results, let me just uh, make a quick remark that, well, actually with this scheme, the generalized degrees of freedom can be, can be achieved. In this, uh, the degrees of freedom for the MISO broadcasting channel under finite precision CSI IT. Well, actually the, the generalized degrees of freedom is a, a proxy for the, for the capacity. And it's an, asy an asymptotic metric, right? As we can see here, this is a limit when the transmit power goes to infinity, right? Of the, the sum rate divided by the, the capacity of the corresponding Gaussian, Gaussian channel. Well, with this uh, technique, this uh, can be achieved, can be proved also that it can be achieved. Although our interest is, our main driver is just the performance in the finite SNR regime. So that's why the results I'm, I'm going to show next, they correspond to the, to the finite regime. So let me start with a simple case, with a symmetric case, because with, that, with just one parameter, we'll be able to solve it. The symmetric case in the sense that the, all the, 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 the direct paths, they have the same SNR, and the cross interfering paths, they have also the same, the same weight denoted by interference to noise ratio I and R, right? And for this uh, symmetric case, what I'm, going what I'm going to show is just the, the comparison with the Hankov adjust scheme, just to, just to show the, the importance of the, of the cooperation. So on the, on the left, I'm showing the, the generalized degrees of freedom. Those are the, the thick lines for both the, our case, and also for, for Han, uh, Han Kobayashi. With respect, with respect to the ratio between the, the, the value of the, of the interference with respect to the direct links, uh, right? So towards the right, the interference grows so that for this value equal to one, the cross interference magnitude is the same as the uh, direct uh, as the direct channels. When the interference grows very 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 high, the essentially the performance of Alamuti and the degrees of freedom of the interference channel is the same as the performance of the MISO broadcasting channel. I mean, there's not much to do that we can achieve through through cooperation. But if the interference starts decreasing, well, the degrees of freedom of the missile broadcasting channel, of course, are higher than the corresponding degrees of freedom of the of a, the interference channel, and also the performance of our scheme, of course, is higher is better than the performance of a, of Alamuti, and this is because the interference is lower. On the right, by the way, this corresponds to an SNR of 15 dBs, and on the right, we are, we are just uh, plotting the the weighting. The, the weighting, this weighting factor is such that one corresponds to all the way goes to the private message, I mean, uh, and zero corresponds to all the way goes to the common message. When interfering is very high in both our case in Alamut and Hanko Bayasi, all the way goes uh, 
all the, the message is just composed of the common message. And the main difference is just Alamut is, all, uh, I'm sorry, Hanko Bajas is uh, almost uh, binary, whereas the proposed rate splitting scheme is uh, smoother when transitioning from a low interference regime to a high interference regime. And just to complete here this case, let me show the numerical the numerical results for the for a non-symmetric case. Here we we label the magnitudes of the different involved channels, and we plot a number of a number of curves. The I mean the benchmark is the dirty paper coding. I mean there's a important and relevant gap between the between our the performance of our curves and other schemes with respect to dirty paper coding, because dirty paper coding, of course, is exploring the phase, the knowledge of the phase. Okay, so that's why we are significantly far away from that. There's a per antenna power constraint, as I mentioned. Of course, dirty paper coding is computed for the under that uh, constraint, and the the pink curve in both cases corresponds to our space-time rate splitting scheme. And all the others correspond to different schemes, the orthogonal, either, either time or frequency, the superposition coding that we uh, mentioned earlier for the vector magnitude channel. And the blue one, which is close in both cases to our curve, is what I refer to interference enhancement. Actually, this curve corresponds to the transmission of the same common message from both antennas. The very same common message is transmitted from both antennas. Well, actually, this uh, scheme is uh, is proposed in some papers from from Jafar for the finite precision CSIT, but it's optimal for a very high SNR. And what we have done here, actually, this is not an achievable curve because actually we have uh, optimized the weights of the private and the common message under the assumption that the phase is known, which is not the case. But uh, just to to make it um, to show something related to that scheme, because the performance of that method when you transmit the same message from both antennas depends on the specific phase, relative phase of the channel. Here we run a number of realizations with random phases. So again, this is a sort of geniated curve, the the blue the blue one, which in practice is a sort of a upper bound for the ergodic capacity of this. Uh, of this uh, scheme, interference enhancement scheme. So as a summary, well, with the proposed scheme, we can do better than other existing schemes, although there's still a significant gap due to the absence of the phase, of the phase information. A final remark regarding the SATCOM scenario would be, okay, I have shown results for two users, but when you have a number of beams, what should we do? Well, actually, we have a number of beams here and with two different colors. A color here means a different uh, spectrum allocation. So the, the beams with under the same color, they could interference to each other. So essentially, it becomes very relevant just to pick just the pairing of users. It becomes very important just to pair the users in order to achieve the previous, the previous scheme. So again, I show a scheme for two users. Now we will move on to the system level because in the remaining slides, I will put some emphasis on the system on system level considerations. When we get to the system, le uh, system level, we need just to take care of a number of things. One of them is of course the, the pairing of users in order to apply schemes like this. This was just a, a remark on the practical application of this. But if we want to, to move uh, beyond two users, well, there's a number of things that could be discussed because when considering common messages, if you have more than two users, things like the grouping of users, like uh, the, a multi-level uh, number of uh, common messages become relevant and everything can become quite uh, complicated, right? With more than three users when we apply the uh, rate splitting. So one simplification would be just to consider a, common, a message which is, which is common for all the involved users. So there's a, this case, which is especially relevant in SATCOM, which is the case where traffic is non-uniformly distributed, 
right? For example, here we have seven cells or each of these uh, cells is served by a different antenna on the satellite, right? And traffic is now uniformly distributed in such a way that this is, would be known as a hotspot case where most mm, the density of the, in this case, the central, the central beam is definitely much higher than the density of the surrounding beam. So what we can do, do is apply a sort of a resource pooling in the sense that, okay, the, the surrounding beams are going to, to donate resources to the central beam. So here we have seven antennas, seven cells. We, we just choose seven users on the central beam, users that should be located not anywhere, but I mean, one user near to the center, we've applied this uh, division in sectors and the other users on each of the outer sectors. So the idea is, okay, let's serve this, uh, in this case, seven users, six plus one, six plus one central user with these seven antennas. Of course, the magnitude of the, of the channel of the outer users will be lower the magnitude of the channel of the central user because this of the outer user will be served by the surrounding cells. But still, if the traffic asymmetry is significant, it may be worth just to do to do that. I'll show you, with, I'll show you that later with the, some results. So the idea is okay, let's use these seven antennas to serve these seven users at the same time by applying a rate splitting through this resource polling. So for the analysis, we assume symmetry, although of course in simulation symmetry is, is not assumed anymore, but for the analysis in the sense that we assume the something like this, the same distances for all the users, but the central user, the magnitude of the channel for the central user is higher than for the others. And all the, the cross interference is the same for all the, for all the users. And again, we just know only the channel magnitude. Just for simplicity, one common message, the central beam, this beam it will transmit uh, this signal made of a common message and the private message. And each of the outer uh, beams will transmit again a common message one, and a private message. And we need just to design again two parameters. Even though we have more than two users, an arbitrary number of users, in this specific example seven, we only have two, uh, two parameters because we are assuming symmetry. So the relative weight between private and common for each of the outer users will be, will be the same. It turns out that the, I'm not sure here the result, but it turns out that the optimal solution is close to NOMA. That is the optimal solution is just very close, not exactly, but it's closer and closer when N, when N grows. It's closer to NOMA in the sense that the, the central beam should just transmit a, a common message and the outer beams just a private message for each of the outer users. And that's uh, quite convenient because it simplifies uh, things uh, a lot. There's no need to apply any space time coding, just a quite simple uh, NOMA scheme as a particular, uh, particular case of rate splitting. This is it, the central common message and the other uses are private. So for the results, we're going to compare the performance with the pre-coding. All this is not fair because pre-coding uses a full CSIT. In particular, we will uh, compare with the MMSC pre-coder, which has a, a closed form that we know already. And we will use uh, something which is known performance pre-coder, which needs a numerical solution which is the solution to this maximization problem. That is, let's maximize the sum rate. Let's design a precoder which maximizes the, the sum rate for all the, for all the users. Again, there's no closed form expression for, for this. That's why we refer to, to this as a numerical solution. And here we show the results very quickly. On the left, the achievable spectral efficiency. On the right, the, the fairness through the Jane index. What is remarkable here is that, of course, the numerical precoder uh, outperforms all the other methods that's uh, expected. But it, what is uh, striking is the, the NOMA solution and the rate splitting solution, both of them 
are quite uh, competitive with respect to the MMSC precoder, which is using a phase. Of course, this is due to the specific features of our, of our problem, right? For a general case, that would not apply, of course. And in terms of um, fairness, well, numerical precoder is not fair at all because you just try to maximize the sound rate. So it's the, the least fair of all methods. And our met, uh, the proposed methods are either rate splitting or NOMA. They are quite fair. Even we also design a new method based on the maximization of a harmonic mean, not just the sound rate, but the harmonic mean that of course, as expected in terms of fairness is the, is the best. So just to, to conclude, let me just, this is a very short exposition, uh, uh, another case that we touch upon during the course of our activities on satellite communication, which is the beam free approach, where we are going to apply NOMA to exploit some uh, signal to noise ratio imbalances that we find in some cases that I'll mention now in a minute. Again, with NOMA, rather than our zone allocation, we allocate power to the, let's call a strong user and some power to the weak user, right? We know that with that, it's possible to achieve a more efficient rate allocation. Here, we, for this specific example, we have a 10 dB gap between the strong user and the weak user. You know all know about that. Well, and why is this uh, relevant for us? Well, because when for multi beam cases, I mean, there's a radiation uh, pattern for each uh, cell here. For example, here we have a radiation pattern for the antenna so that the SNR of the users decrease when they move away from the center to the, to the boundary of the respective beam. That's one of the reasons just to find uh, different values for the SNR that can be exploited by a NOMA scheme. And here, what we're doing is just, okay, so we can pair users for example, we have a black dots or green dots or red dots or blue dots. We compare those users and serve them with NOMA. Even, they could even be in different beams because even though the, radi the radiation pattern degrades, the level could be still significant just to provide some gain. So with the four antennas, we are able to serve eight users at the same, at the same time. Another source of asymmetry for the SNR is just the SNR unbalanced due to different types of terminals because they could have different gains. The antennas could have different gains. So with that, you can also expect some asymmetry in the received SNR of the terminals with make NOMA also an interesting approach for just to optimize the, the, the rate. So very quickly, the optimization process actually needs to account for the pairing of users, this is a resource allocation, the user pairing, and also the rate optimization. That is, we need, for a given pair, we want to maximize the weighted, the weighted uh, sum of the corresponding rates. And the weights on this specific case were, have been designed by using the proportional pair scheduling policy. Of course, the, the, weights, ha, the, the, the weights and the, the NOMA parameter has closed form expressions. The problem is that the resource allocation, the user pairing is uh, somewhat uh, complicated. That's an NPHAR problem as you, all, as you all know. Here, well, we have found some heuristic methods based on one to, one to many matching, uh, matching principles. And with that, we were able to, to, to obtain some results. In this case, for 16, for 16 beams and 300 times, uh, time slots, we achieved these uh, results for the for a SNR gap of 12 dB. Again, this is the application of NOMA for a multi-beam coverage where we are exploiting the asymmetries on the SNR of the users because either, either because of their location or because they have they are different different antennas, different antenna gains. On the left, all, all terminals are similar. So that's why the, the gains with the, the sound rate improvement with respect to the orthogonal case is not uh, great. Here we have 13% uh, on the best case because this depends on the traffic symmetry. The traffic symmetry measures whether all, all beams have the same amount of traffic, 100%, all, some of them have a different amount of traffic. 
0% means that half of the beams are empty. And that's the most interesting case when applying NOMA. On the right, we have a heterogeneous case where half of the terminals have an SNR, which is 12 dB lower than the other half. And here, of course, the gains are definitely higher, around 25%, essentially for all the levels of uh, traffic asymmetry. So just to wrap up here, we just covered the application of rate splitting and a spe specific instance also NOMA for different cases in the satellite uh, communications arena, cognitive radio or multiple inputs in pedal with broadcast channel. And also we have touched upon cell-free cell -free approaches in all of them. The common denominator is that we don't have any phase information whatsoever, but still we can apply a link uh, adaptation but the, all this depends on a very careful uh, choosing of users and pairing at the system level. And of course, the users need to apply one sick uh, stage just to make all this uh, practical. So this concludes. Here are some references for the, for the audience. And now I think Lina will just uh, drive the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Mascaras, for a very interesting talk. Any question? Uh, if you have any question, you can unmute yourself to raise, or you can type the question in the chat box. Okay, so actually, I have some questions. Uh, one general question is that uh, because uh, when you consider this uh, being free or uh, 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 magnitude CSIT. So you consider the independent transmission from each antenna, right? So there, am I right? Um, you mean for, for example, for uh, this case? Uh, yes. So for this case, for each antenna, yeah. the signal transmitted is independently, right? Right, yeah. On the on this case, each color denotes a different frequency carrier. On this specific oh. case, each, an each antenna is just serving two users through a NOMA scheme, but they are uh, transmitting independent signals. On this specific case, yeah, that's the, the case. Okay, I see. So you mean that the beam, because I'm trying to understand the beam uh, you mentioned uh, in, in this play, uh, in this uh, problem. So this beam is because of the uh, yeah, the bit, yeah, the the uh, perhaps I was not uh, I didn't detail that enough. I mean, a beam corresponds to the radiation from a specific antenna towards a uh, its corresponding footprint. This footprint here is the is a cell which is served by an antenna. So the beam, the beam is just the radiation of this antenna towards this uh, specific cell, although. Some of the radiation leaks onto neighboring neighboring cells, but that's why you need to apply in some cases a frequency a, a color mapping just to separate uh, to make orthogonal the resources of uh, neighbor uh, cells. Otherwise, you will have a, a very high level of cross uh, co-channel interference. I see. So the beam depends on uh, the, the, the distance, for example, from the uh, from that specific antenna to the yeah. users. Or okay. Yeah, yeah. In some modern satellites, you can you could also apply beam forming. So the beams are okay. sort of adaptive. Uh, we have some results for that, those cases, but here we just uh, were considering fixed uh, fixed beams. I see. Not, not adaptive. So, so users within that beam has been already decided or determined uh, before yeah. you transmit. For fixed okay. beams, yeah, that's the that's the case. I see. Yeah, another maybe very naive and general question is because uh, I'm curious because um, because I I have no idea or I don't know the very. Uh, uh, specific difference compared with the satellite uh, CSI transmission compared mm -hmm. with the uh, terrestrial. So my question is that, is it possible uh, to have CSI T transmission, you know, from satellite to the uh, ground users? It is actually some, there are even some uh, 
practical schemes based on precoding. For precoding, you you need the phase to to have the magnitude on the phase, but it's not actually raises a number of issues. It's not easy to start with because of the long propagation distances, and um, it requires yeah when the mobility is uh, at stake. Uh, for example, that makes hard uh, things uh, more complicated because there you have an uh, outdated version of the of the channel. That's why we consider here only magnitude because phase changes uh, faster than magnitude. So in on the all these all these cases we consider just manual information, but even phase is uh, is possible. In some cases you can relay back to the to the transmitter, which actually is not even on the satellite. In many cases on a terrestrial uh, a ground station, right? And you can relay back the channel state information, including both magnitude and phase. Yeah, in some cases is it can be done. I see. So when a user feedbacks their, for example, their uh, their CSI back to the satellite, they will ask, uh, for example, the base stations to assist the transmission, or the feedback works directly. I mean, no, no, yeah. I mean, all a number of users, for example, they relay back uh, their ch corresponding channel state information. So the the gateway or the ground station needs to take decisions in terms of pre-coding in case they apply pre-coding or for example, a coding and modulation scheme depending on the SNR, for example. And yeah, that, that's very, very important. I mean, just to have a good and accurate knowledge about the SNR in order just to mm -hmm. choose the corresponding, uh, the corresponding schemes, coding and modulation schemes. I see. Yeah, uh, so one very tiny question is on page uh, 26, the, the rate region figure that you illustrated. Uh, because uh, when you mentioned DPC, uh, even when, yeah, yeah, this figure, because when we consider only a single user is served, uh, DPC still outperforms other strategies. Uh, yeah. Yes, I like two corner point. Yeah, this is what I mean. So I'm curious, uh, uh, what's the major reason when a single user is uh, served, a DPC can still outperform it, other strategies? Yeah, in the case here, yeah, you have, um, let's say two antennas serving uh, one user. That's the case uh, on, on, both, on both edges, right? But you can exploit the, the phase. I see. So when we consider DPC, we consider perfect CSI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you have this significant gap here. Uh -huh. the, re the red curve, uh, in par the particular case of the circles, it just is exploiting the phase. I see. Okay. Which is something that we have. Actually, it would be nice just to find there's something in between. I'm not aware of any result for just to fill this, uh, this gap, because there's still a significant gap due to the absence of this information. Yeah, I understand. Okay, any other questions from the audience? All very familiar with the topic. Please feel free to unmute yourself to ask question if you have any question. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 I have uh, some other question. Uh, I mean, uh, if the respecting compared to the uh, method we used in the satellite now, I mean, some business plan, uh, do we have any uh, benefit from the respecting compared to the business plan? I mean, they may use some different uh, methods to keep the reliability or some other properties. So, so I mean, if we compare these two methods, can we uh, get some uh, benefit from the respecting? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, if I got it right, you were uh, pointing out to the comparison between rate splitting of a massive MIMO, is that correct? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point because the thing is that it, all these compressions depends a lot on the type of architecture that you are considering. Mm -hmm. In this case, for the for the satellite payload. So the cases that I'm I have considered here, they are they do not fall under the the framework of massive MIMO. 
So that's why I didn't make any compression with that. But it's true that most, uh, some most recent satellites, they have a number of antennas such that you can start making this type of uh, considerations. Even what I mentioned earlier about uh, beam, uh, adaptive beam forming and all that. So for that case, yeah, you you have a you have a point there. This is not the architect type of architecture that I have considered here, but but yeah, it is true. Actually, you can find some very very recent papers that uh, addressing the specific application of massive MIMO to satellites. If you are interested, I mean, you yeah, are not just able can't to find them. Just it. send me an email. Yeah. I can refer you to some very relevant sources. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Okay, so if there's no question, I will end our webinar today. So thank you again for Professors uh, uh, Mosteros for this very interesting talk. And uh, a quick reminder that our last webinar will be held on January 18th, so will be next year. And the talk will be given by Professor Wolfgang Eustrich from Technical University of Munich. And you can go to our webinar for more information. Okay, and another reminder is that the deadline of the paper submission for our uh, WCNC workshop on RSMA is coming soon. Uh, so it's December uh, 31st. And uh, if you have any ready work or prepared work, uh, please feel free to submit. And the more information can be found in the WCNC website. Okay, so looking forward to seeing you next year and I wish you a happy Christmas and a happy new year. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy, new year. happy new year. Bye bye. bye.